Welcome. This is the January 17th OpenZFS production user call. We have Rod, Stu, Levi, Daniel, and myself. And Daniel, you have been making great progress on Zelta. Let her rip. Hello, all. Um, hopefully, just a quick update. I am, uh, you know, trying to trying to do more sort of tuning up, but Zelta is a, you know, a simple tool for you know, typical management issues that we have. So matching snapshots together, uh, making sure that uh, source and destination tell you the differences between them, um, uh, do replications, either incrementals or, or new re replication sets, and then a, a policy-based backup system. And it's sort of in a Unix-y fashion. So, you know, each, each little tool helps the other one. What I've been working on lately with uh, with it is is trying to add some some analytics. So somebody on this very call suggested that I provide output for the replications in in JSON. So uh, so I've started to Hoover that into Grafana to show you uh, sort of how simple it can be to uh, to get some great analytics for your for your fleet. Um, so I've I've obfuscated some some data here in Grafana and I'll just I'll just do a quick demo of that. Awesome. Um yeah, so I have so I have two of my backup servers in different dashboards on on Grafana and this just takes the JSON that exports from the Zelta backup script that I made, which is which is a really simple configuration file. I'll show I'll, I'll go in reverse and I'll show you the pretty the pretty colors first and then show you how ridiculously ridiculously simple I tried to make it to to, to get to this point. Um, but here I've got you know of course replication sizes and then total total backup time and then I break the uh, break each listing uh, time down. So what this what this helped me do already is, Figure out some some weird places where uh, where my backups were running like a little bit too slow, and there are things that you just it's just impossible to create an alert, an Agios alert for every imaginable edge case that you could have. So you know, I'm totally convinced now that creating visualizations was just a huge uh, huge benefit for me. Um, so and then the policy. So just to just to show you that this this is created. Um, oh, oh, by the way, all I did I didn't know a thing about Grafana. Like all I did was I asked ChatGPT three questions and I dumped the data into an SQLite database, and it was just it it was just so. I mean, it it was like nothing nothing to figure out how to wow how to do this. Uh, you know, like just really basic SQL that can be pumped out by a uh, robot, a uh, dumb chat GPT robot uh, pretty, pretty easily. Um, so yeah, anyway, this is, this is very, I found this to be very helpful for, you know, just, you know, getting a, get a, getting a good bird's eye view of what's going on. So I'm sort of, I'm sort of, my, my organization this year is going to go into the hundreds of, of you know, yeah, uh, data sets managed. I mean, you know, thousands of volumes, hundreds of, uh, you know, hundreds of different data sets for different clients. So I just can't, I just can't do it all manually anymore. So to so run Zelta, it's the word Zelta. And then this, this is the configuration file. So the only thing you need is a name of a host and the source and the target. And then there's there's lots of ways to sort of simplify this. So, um, like if if you're cool with just the final label um, being the backup name, you specify that. And then there's all sorts of different ways to to um, assist with naming. For example, there you can add the host's name to your to your target volume and and so on. So this is this is about the so this is the policy manager. There's other there's also two other bits of uh, you know two other little utilities that this is based on. Um, one that does uh, comparisons between two data sets. 
and you just add your user at host if it's a ZFS. And another one that does replications based on the lists generated here. So I'm trying to take a very Unixy approach and then just sort of very slowly, incrementally add uh, add different different features. The next thing I'm going to add is is some caching, I think, and uh, you know allow it to have a bit of a memory so that it can deal with resumes and um, and other other cases like that. But you know, but you know, in a nutshell, um, let's see. You know, in a nutshell, it's just a wrapper for the ZFS commands we run constantly. So, um, uh, that's that's going to take a while. Let's see. Okay, this one will be quick. Okay, so if I do dash n for dry run, then this is all it's doing. So. The idea is these are commands that we have to run a million times a day. So, so we need to get unique information about something, sort it by the fastest method possible, show the snapshots, and then compare the two data sets. This is something that I do all day long is trim, you know, trim the top line out of out of something and run it. So it's it's I'm trying to, I'm trying to sort of just create the scaffolding for for things that we just have to do constantly all day, every day when we're managing our, our ZFS sets. And then what the output that we get is, here's what the latest data, uh, here's what the latest snapshot is, and here's what the new one is. So you see they're, they're different. And then it's the same command with sync instead of match, and it'll update it. That's it. My permissions aren't quite right, but, here we go, sent one stream, and now we do a match again, and it's done. So these are, again, these are just, you know, the, the simplest possible, um, you know, the things that we do every day, and it helps you craft simple commands. And then the policy manager does that in order and spits out lots and lots of delicious noise. And that's that's all that's new. Oh, oh! Don't bury any leads here. Uh, I'll put in the docs. I did a Control T yesterday, and magic happened. <laughs> so it sounds like you've added Control T support. Have you not? Yeah. So, oh, that was since the last call. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. so. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, uh, yeah. So for for large. For large, uh, I mean, it, dash V will give you as much noise as you want, but Control T during a during a replication will spit out the progress and a um, you know whatever queued uh, verbose messages are are incoming. So that looks like I dropped some of the chat from my oh, own use of it. I was like, oh, that worked. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there you go. So there's a, there's a control T. There's another one. <laughs> you can see you can see its progress. So one one trick is for this for this type of wrapper, at least with with auth, and and I wanted this to be a utility that works a hundred percent in in you know the base for most Unixes. Um, so it's so it's pure auth. So that does limit my ability to to add a wrapper and deal deal with signals and stuff like that. So. Um, so you only get the, I couldn't get it hooked into, into, um, a progress bar. So ah, DPV yeah. does ship with FreeBSD, So it would be possible, uh, to, to do that, but that might be outside of, you know, of, of my abilities. Cause, cause part of the, the policy management does need to be able to see all of the, um, uh, all the error messages, then all of the uh, the uh, output from from the requisite uh, tools, because it's going to it's going to take action based on it. Like the retry option, if it sees an error, it's going to retry that uh, replication. Um, so, you know, so I couldn't figure out a way to add the progress manager while keeping all that intact, while keeping it pretty simple. So. 
but the control T I think is a pretty good workaround. Like, uh, you know, let's, let's see if, let's see if you're alive, press control T and it says, tells you how much it plans to send and how much it's sent so far. So I think that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good workaround to provide a little, you know, are you alive there? Um, and, uh, yeah, without without doing a full blown PV or DPV kind of kind of thing, which which would be super nice to have. It's just you know, let's let's pick which which nice things we want for Absolutely. for each tool. Um, yeah, should I, I? I could I could do just just one quick um, note before I stop. I this this was a Michael Dexter idea to. Um, to use ZFS's written um, and other and other properties to 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 provide the intelligence needed to create sort of a a simple async cluster. Um, so I have a I have a little jail based work in progress where you have a really really simple uh, Zelta config, and you just put this on two servers and then run them from time to time. And what happens is this is this is going to sound weird, but what happens is which whichever machine it, it'll snapshot based on the written flag with this with this dumb little shell script here. So what you can do with that is wherever if you have two servers syncing back and forth between each other, and you only snapshot when it's written, um, with a little bit of scaffolding, wherever you start. A, an instance, wherever you start a VM or jail, that guy is going to be the primary and sync to the secondary and back and forth. Now, for scaffolding, that I mean, that's, that's, that's super cool, I think. I, I think if, if we had, you know, uh, some tools that with with the basic bare bone, no compiled anything in, in Unix base, that could do that, that would be, I think that would be handy for a lot of people, you know, no third party requirements, uh, and so on. <laughs> that would be, that would be pretty nice, nice to have, but, uh, yeah, just start the, start the VM or instance wherever it, it is. So you turn it off, you, you run the, you know, you make sure the sync is up to date. Let's say you, you set as read only, um, on the, on the machine that you don't want. So, so literally one or two, one or two commands plus a replication, and all you have to do is boot the 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 instance on the other on the other machine, and it'll, uh, and that will be the primary between a pair. Um. So, here's here's a little work in progress. So I created four jails, inst one, two, three, and four on this VM. Oops, and you know, and then just sync them to this this second VM, and then I'm not going to do the whole demo now, but this little guy, imagine this program, some program like this, and this is this is all the script. I mean, this is just this sucker right here, mm. um, runs on a third machine, a tiebreaker, let's say, and and that's that's the machine that decides where the machine is booted. At any 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 time, we have a basic async works as well as it needs to for eighty percent of cluster situations without a cluster, just using uh, you know uh, ZFS and a couple of properties that it has. So um, anyway, so that's that's cool. I'm going to put this sucker in production um, for you know some low low risk machine so I can find out what the what the bugs are. I think I probably want to do a read-only flag for uh, the standby machine because it takes exactly zero seconds to turn that flag off. So why not? Um, to, to guarantee it's always syncing uh, one way based on the, the written flag. And I'll probably have to do some pruning and some tweaks to the backup and stuff like that. But uh, zero effort. And, um, and we got to, we got to, Async cluster, kind of, kind of, not really. Well, you, you can call it that. And uh, I will simply emphasize, especially based on what I've been confirming, and I hope I shared the right screen. Do you see the 
Uh, do you see a pretty picture? Now we do. Now you do. Okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, first off, I've been using, well, one, this. Two, I it just occurred to me that if you've shut down a VM or jail and the written prop and it yeah, and snapshot it and the written property is zero because you snapshotted it and you've replicated it, you by definition know you're good short of the guest OS taking a dump on its own file system, but that's par for the course. And hopefully it did a sync at shutdown, et cetera, like back in the 80s, sync, sync, sync. So I realize if you've got like three hosts and 30 VMs, you could well, consolidate all on one or darn near round rob and boot them up as long as the housekeeping is done that they can each boot and on each host with, you know, Mac addresses handled and networking set up. But uh, Levi's on the call. We looked at clustering quite a bit. And the more I read about it, the less confident I felt that with every step. And if you really want to upset a Gluster user, ask them how you like reintegrate a node. They'll, they'll just sort of you know, run screaming in some cases. I'm like, guys, uh, you're not helping me here. I'm, I'm not feeling it. So that there, said, all cluster users. Apparently, they're out there. Hey, I was a cluster user. It was horrible. I was too, and I learned from my mistakes. <laughs> Quite a bit, but yeah, ended in trusting, ended trusting in Red Hat to do anything it's, right. It's the, I think it's archaic but the only place i've ever seen clustering done well and done right was vmx vax vax clusters no. <laughs> not, not, well approved. not cluster clustering cluster g yep that's what he's saying in general yeah in general oh. <laughs> I vms think, has this I... really neat thing called distributed lock manager and distributed file systems that give you yeah. all of what gluster tries to do I think I could do well with the Gluster if I was going to do it again. I just never will <laughs> because I, I feel like I feel like I can get really ninety five percent of the way there with with just with just a little less stress. Also, like you have to re you have to patch your house. Like every, you have to patch your instances. You just you just have to. There's going to be a time when you reboot the thing. You can reboot and move, like. I, I don't know. I just I, I think that the, this last one percent of perfect of, of perfect failover in a in the flash of a of an eye is is adds more risk than reward. One, Daniel, great, great work. Two, any questions for Daniel? Uh, you know, some of you are blamed for uh, to blame for asking for some of these features, and you got them. So I hope Pete, they're they're so, matching what oh. you envision. <laughs> Uh, so Daniel, every everything you do, everything you've done looks great, and I'm you know glad I'm a smart ass and <laughs> suggested some things. However, <laughs> we need to get beyond just FreeBSD. Well, you have Oct on I your will. systems, <laughs> Oct is not Oct, the way you're using Oct does not work on Ubuntu. Really, that's really? interesting because it does it does work on because because you can um, you can remote control multiple machines from a Mac. With this guy, but uh, that's that's interesting. I wonder what. It, so it, I I know Bart, that there was a sys, there was a sys time that I that I removed that dependency. Bart, I'm gonna so, have to. Bart, on, one at time. Closes. What's that? What's breaking? It barfs every time. Every <clears throat> on the pre-processing, it barfs on all the closes. Hmm. On the closes. So every time you're closing a function, it's breaking and. I'm remiss. I played with it last week, and I had started building the the patch report or the bug report on GitHub, and I never finished it. Um, but yeah, it's every, every time you comment out the closes and some other errors show up. So, um, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna check that because I do have, I mean, I do have backup hosts that are, well, I mean, obviously that's that's not a problem because it's just using ZFS commands. Um, okay, so running from a, Run, a so it doesn't it doesn't okay so yeah, I running have on, running on an Ubuntu twenty two o four, a Git two a twenty two o four both of them barf on either side. I can run the normal ZFS commands between them. Just mm -hmm. I want one to validate and make sure that everything was working. Um, 
infrastructurally before I said, hey, it's your code. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a something in the awk versions between FreeBSD and how Ubuntu is processing it. It's not. There might be, yeah, there might be a dash P flag or something like that that'll do POSIX mode and, and be more forgiving. I'm going to check uh that is that will be okay so that is more important than than any caching and auto resume is making sure that this this works for more than uh, more than mac os so and uh and and bsds um so yeah i i so i was i tested yeah i tested on on one one true off knock and uh you know whatever max version is so all right well that that i'm gonna i'm gonna fix i bet you it's easier than it sounds to fix i in fact i might be able to just put a flag in the wrapper and that that might do the trick so could be, um, could, be could be something that simple i just haven't dug into it at all or, i yeah i just did a quick google and according to the ask you want to it, Ubuntu 2204 is using MAWK, mock, not. Yeah, all right. So they're using some other implementation. So yeah. I suspect you can fix this on Ubuntu by installing. Well, mock, mock, well, mock, mock, and mock are all linked to the same thing inside of Ubuntu. But the it says the implementation specifically is mock. I well, my goal is to make sure that this runs in as many, you know, without dependencies. So I think that I think it would be fair for me to do, you know, dependencies in Linux also, low, low dependencies in Linux also. So I'd prefer it not to have to install anything. However, if the, the wrapper has to change a bit between OSs, I think that's fair. Yeah, detect the OS and say, okay, and this is your instance, and just like ninety percent of yeah. the Awk, awk equals awk dash dash posix, and then we're good to go, maybe. So we'll, we'll see. Stu, Perfect. just to be clear, how are you obtaining awk? Is that built into the absolute base OS, or do you have to add a package? It's OS. Okay, got it. So whatever they call their base. Got it, got it. Awesome, Daniel. Anything else on this topic? Okay, uh, welcome, Greg and Jesse. Do you have any topics to address? Yeah, I cornered you. I, yeah, sorry, I, I do not, not today, <clears throat> thanks. And Greg, you were up against some walls last round. Did you, oh, you had the uh, art. The streaming issue, yeah. Dumping. Have you made any progress on that? Um, very little. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this week and part of last week and most of the weekend, uh, we had a uh, multiple HVAC failures in our uh, in our server room. Uh, I'm up here in Toronto, and the uh, the weather they got a lot colder over the weekend, and apparently, you too, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that introduced some issues. So we um we had two units fail. Because uh, the one failed and the other was struggling to keep the room cool. It was doing it, but I guess it was working too hard. And oh boy. yeah, and and so on Saturday we got the one fixed, and then Sunday night the one the other one failed. <laughs> so oh boy, yeah. So well, anyways, um, to you. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have not done too much to it, but what I have done, um, yes. I went to the uh, to the client, which is Windows. Um, it indeed was using an incorrect MTU. It was set to fifteen hundred instead of nine thousand, so I adjusted that. But um, that didn't do anything, and it kind of makes sense because, like I said, the other file server was was able to keep up um, with that setting. Uh, and I started. I opened a ticket with the uh, the vendor to see if they're aware of any issues. Um, with different vendor file systems. And then I installed a couple of uh, disk performance tools um, that tell you which codec types uh, the, the particular machine you're testing on will be able to do uh, uncompressed in various formats. Such as AJA and Blackmagic or do you have all that? Else? Yeah, yeah, exactly. All <laughs> okay, that stuff. Cool. So we're doing ultra HD with the, uh, with, um, 
uh, 10 bit. Hmm. Um, yeah. And uh, interestingly, the, uh, the ZFS server uh, was more performant than our, uh, than our um, proprietary file server by Cumulo. And um, that was a bit surprising, but the editor said to me, uh, yeah, I've seen that before. It really doesn't make a difference when you're streaming uh, uh, frames to be uh, to be and, viewed. And part of it, part of it too, with those test kits, they hit cache. They will not go to disk unless you force them. Right. Yeah. And I, I was using different uh, sizes and whatnot to try and get around that and unmount and the uh, client mounting it again. But but yes, you're you're correct. So um, by adding an extra four terabytes of cache, I, I you know I knew right from the time I did, I was just putting a band aid on it. Um, and and they do say that it works better now, but it they can still show me examples of it stuttering. So the interesting thing was um, movie files, MOV files. Um, if they took the uncompressed frames and they change them into movie files, which isn't unusual for them to do for whatever reason. I guess they also ship those off to clients or whatever to review. Um, on the system before, those two would stutter, just not the uh, big EXRs that we're trying to stream. Now the movie files uh, play fine. So I, I don't, you know, I made the uh, atypical mistake of changing more than one thing at once. So I'm not sure what uh, fix it because I changed the MTU. And I added the cache, the extra L2R cache to it. Um, so now movie files play fine, but the EXRs, uh, while they perform better, there's still there's still st stalls there sometimes when when it's streaming them back. Interesting. Yeah, and it is. This was resolved, right? Yes, it is. Yeah, Teradici or not Teradici, Da Vinci. Sorry. Has anyone? Cleverly belted out FIO uh, film workload simulation syntax. I've I mean, got FIO is designed to model workloads, but then you go look for a modeled workload, and there are like three out there, which maybe everyone just keeps them close to their chest. I don't know. Now, my, mine are more for proofing out the disks, not testing the workflow. It's okay. Like, you do it before the system ship. Yeah. If there's, any, if there's any rust, it will unrust. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do you yeah. attempt to model the workload, or you just exercise the disks and call I it? I exercise good? based upon the size of the system. Okay. So cool. If it's, if it's you know, a, you know, sixty four processor system with sixty drives, it gets a different model than a twelve by twelve. Got it. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so all that being said, that's it's, I can share that real easy. Oh, that'd be yeah, for, for what it's worth. I mean, I would love to see a repo out there of just workloads like uh, Rodney ftp.cdrom.com. I would love to see a sort of retro recreation of its workload back in ninety something with FIO, just because that's kind of what it's supposed to do, just academically. Yeah, that would be good. Um, yeah, so. Uh, tomorrow i plan to start looking at this again the unfortunate thing is there's we have two screen rooms where we uh like they're like mini theaters type of thing yeah. um and uh, both of them are usually booked right up until around seven o'clock at night or whatever so i have to stay like super late to get in there and play around understood but, yeah and i usually feel like it's beer o'clock at around seven o'clock so it's uh, i don't want to be at work <laughs> yeah i hear you if i can spell okay great thank you for that update uh and it's just an open request please share file workload simulations i that I, I keep forgetting about that and i've got my own i'll try to dig some up and share anyway uh anything else before rodney tells us about some nifty dual booting news Rod is now a good time. As good as it gets. There you go. Okay, you have the floor. Rain, the rain is no longer freezing. So oh perfect. Yeah. Um, anyway, I think it was in this call that I had talked about some dual booting stuff that I was doing with Proxmox and FreeBSD. 
Um, and that was using x86 and FreeBSD 13.2 and Proxmox 74 something. Um, because simply the choices there were because they had compatible pools. Um, I've moved on to Proxmox 813, FreeBSD 14, which have compatible pools, but um, more on that in a minute, and moved from x86 to ARM. Wow. So I'm increasing the complexity as, as I move forward. But the and this the only upside is is the ARM system I have, which is an Orange Pi five plus. If anybody's looking for a nice little Raspberry Pi like thing to play with, um, these things are really nice little boxes. They're a, a eight core, four big, four little Rock thirty five eighty eight um, with a M dot two E key and an M dot to M key slot on them. So you can put in whosoever Wi-Fi you want and whosoever you can put an NVMe SSD in it. So it's not like your typical um single board Raspberry Pi type thing. This thing is a lot more flexible. I've got it running FreeBSD 14, um Orange Pi's own version of Debian, Proxmox. Um, what else have I booted on it? Open word. I, it's just it generally it works for everything. Um, do you generally and, use stock images, or do you have to build your own? So far, this has all been done with stock images. Awesome. Uh, the exception being the FreeBSD fourteen. Somebody else built it. This was an image I went and found and downloaded. He's already he's already figured the pieces out. Um, the other thing is, is there's an ED two K EFI BIOS for this thing. So I have ED. Uh, UEFI flash to the SPI NOR chip. So I have EFI, um, which greatly increases some abilities because then you can use system deboot with ZFS pools um, for booting Linux type things from ZFS and FreeBSD's um, loader.EFI. So it greatly simplifies, it eliminates U-boot. No more U-boot needed. Um, so anyway, I've been able to create a, by starting with Proxmox, I've been able to create a ZFS pool that I then ins manually installed a FreeBSD boot into, um, and can switch back and forth by using the EFI boot manager. I can reboot to the other operating system and that's working pretty smoothly now. There's, um, now that I've figured out and learned about ZFS compatibility pools, I have a hacked Proxmox installer so that I can I can tell it I want to build a ZFS pool with this compatibility. And my FreeBSD installation stuff already has that just by adding a dash o, o compatibility option to my ZFS pool create command. Um, I still want to see those added where we can. Um, FreeBSD one will be fairly easy. Um, the Proxmox will not be so easy. But that's kind of where things are at. Um, it works. It works well. It's kind of nice being able to use a common ZFS pool between multiple operating systems because then things like slash home can be common. Um, and I've actually started looking at extracting out parts of the base OSs into a separate data set so that things like um, Etsy configuration files that are common between different boot pools don't have to be replicated in each boot pool. Um, nice. So and that's kind of thorny, but but it's working so far. I haven't I haven't moved a whole lot into a common boot set. Um, a common data set, but um, that's that's kind of where things are at right now. It's still very much work in progress. There's still there's some thorny knife edges because FreeBSD is really nice because we ha have had for a long time this whole boot environment concept. So we got BE control and that kind of stuff. The Linux world 
doesn't even I don't even think they understand what boot environments are. Um, I have on several occasions left myself non-bootable on a, on the Linux side by what I thought were really stupid little trivial things. Like you can't, even though on the command line, you're explicitly giving it the name of the pool to boot from, but if your ZFS, um, uh, what's the name of the boot pool property? Um, boot boot FS. FS. If your boot FS in the pool that you told the kernel to boot from doesn't match what you told it, Linux just barfs. It, I mean, you don't even get a kernel screen image or anything. It's just like, bleh. Hmm. It's like, it's either blowing up in the end of system deloader and never getting transferred to the kernel or somewhere else. So they seem to be very dependent upon things they probably should not be dependent upon matching. I mean, as far as I know, when you use a boot environment from FreeBSD, it doesn't touch the boot FS property of the pool. I need to verify that that when, when you change when you change active when you do a BE control activate foo if we rewrite the BS the boot FS hmm. the pool I don't think we do or maybe that or is that what that does I think to activate is to specifically update the pools boot FS, but things like a mismatch, you know, you should have lots of, of abilities to temporarily do something, mount something, boot yeah, to yeah, it, whatever. So, yeah, I'm still, there's an unfortunate side effect of being on this arm in this early release ED2K thing in that basically at the end of the EFI thing, it says transferring control to the kernel and then you get nothing for in on the Linux side of things. It depends on what kernel you are on. The Proxmox thing is just silent. You don't, their kernel doesn't output any messages at all and then suddenly the login prompt pops up. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm like, wow, ah, where did all my D message stuff go? That's a feature they added in the six kernel and it's annoying as hell. Is that what it is? Yes, the five kernel still has it. Thank you. Kernel Thank is you. Okay, because I have my Proxmox has both a five and a six kernel. Yeah. And as I could have swore I was seeing those messages and then went away is what it was, was I switched to being the default being the six kernel. Okay. Is there All a right. flag to toggle that? Yeah, yeah. Okay. System, yeah. system Deboot has a, a config file that you can say what the default kernel is. Okay, but, but what about the messages? I mean, don't hide my messages. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I need to figure out how to turn that back on in six. Yeah. And then the uh, other thing is... That Stu, do you know? I, I need. I haven't gone that deep okay. yet. <laughs> okay. But you know what he's talking about. Okay, it's continue. One of those, I noticed it when I sw started switching to six. It's like, all right, it's annoying, but if you wait 20 seconds and everything starts running, it's like... Eh. Yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, it's when... When you're playing with boot environments and right. booting different operations, right. like give me at least give me something, even even say I'm here. <laughs> just a blinky. Just give me a blinky. Come on. Yeah. Dots along the screen. Anything. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. That's good. Does, does push and escape make it come back? No. 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 Okay. No key no keystrokes that I have stumbled across have done it on a six, but My, hmm. I Guarantee I haven't tested everything, but the normal ones haven't done much. My, yeah. my my next step is I'm working on getting Grub EFI installed into my EFI system so that I can boot. Um, I this board I got has I bought the EMMC on it. I've got it installed to the EMMC, but the problem is is that was done with a U boot setup, and so I don't have an easy way to boot to it right now. And I want to get that working. And the way to do that is to put, there's a version of Grub2 that runs in EFI and that can see the file system, at least I've gotten that far. So now I need to write enough Grub2, Grub2 foo to, to get it to boot. Um, and then ultimately I want to move that 
operating system, which is Orange Pi's, um, oh, Debian. They've got a custom built Debian. And one of the reasons I want to get that working is that's got the best board support for all the devices and stuff. It's the only thing I've got a an Intel AX210 working on, which is a, a 802.11ax Ethernet controller. Of all the operating systems I'm running, that's the only one that works it correctly. Proxmox probes it and sees it, but barfs with firmware crashes. Um, lots of lots of fun stuff. Anyway, that is awesome. And when the time comes, what form do you think your wisdom will come in? Will you be open to sharing this, be it through a white paper, through a blog, through probably, a conference I'll probably talk. write something up and stick it somewhere about here. Here was my experience with it. Okay. Some of the work, some of it will come out as fixes to things. Hey, awesome. Awesome. You know, things like getting the, the BSD installer to be able to do compatibility pools. Um, I don't know if I'll... My hack is too ugly that I did to the Proxmox installer to submit a pull request for it. Mm. But I might open an issue with them and let them hack it in correctly. Um, they they need to do some some support work on it. They've got things like the their boot pool name. It appears to me to be hard coded PVE dash one. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean that gets us that gets us back into the end, and they also have our pool. Yep. Hard coded all over the place. Those yep. are not, and those things need to be changed so that they're not hard coded. I, actually, I was that was a question I had for for um. Oh, is it Daniel? Uh, uh, the guy doing the Zelta stuff. Daniel, yeah, you you available? Daniel. He's yeah. here. Okay, the. One of the things that I ran into it a long time ago, the default BSD installer is called everything Z root um, and stuff. And so I ended up with a bunch of machines with with pools named Z root, which meant when I couldn't use the pool name to send the data sets to another pool using the pool name as the, the identifier. There's a dash D option or something like that that you can use on Z pool received to to basically move the data sets into a subdirectory. Does your tool deal with the fact that I may be sending many pools with the same names to the backup mechanism that are actually different machines? Yeah, it's got a couple ways to do that. You can you can specify, or there's an option in the policy manager called host um, host prefix that'll just slap the host name of the source. Uh, yes. It'll prefix it. That's exactly yeah. what I wanted. Good. So it's already there. Beautiful. Yeah, I've I've become really uh hardcore about making sure that like all of my data sets as much as possible are uh are different, are unique. <laughs> it doesn't doesn't work all the time for a host because I've got old ones and they're all zero. So yep. yeah. yeah. What are you gonna do? Uh, fix the BSD installer to quit offering Z root as a default pool name and force the user to give it a name. Yeah. Can we force yeah. against assumptions? Come on. Yeah. You know. And optionally, just sync it with the host name when you ask that question. Anyway. Awesome work, Rod. I'm impressed. I am impressed. There's a whole lot of go with Rod in this scenario. <laughs> That's a lot of work that I've got scar tissue that's going, ow, I remember that. Yep. I've all been there. Whew. I was, I'm actually have been surprised how well this is all working on ARM, given that ARM isn't really, I mean, it, it's not a development platform for doing this type of work on. It just, it happened to have been convenient for me. Wow. For the fun You're doing stuff. Rod's work. Go ahead. Oh, that was bad, Michael. I, I know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, question also for Daniel from Levi. Any way to rate limit with Zelta just to not saturate a link, I presume? 
No. I didn't I, I did not ask like... that. <laughs> Is there I guess there's not there isn't an because it's just a stream, right? So it'd have to be Yeah, see this is this is what I'll miss from like if I don't if, if with a, like a PV mode then you can pass it you can pass it limiters and stuff and SSH doesn't have a limiter right so still still it from our sink yeah right yeah I think I think. Uh, Yeah, I think I think it. I think there's probably a, a decent diversion between sort of the interactive mode, where you where you want progress and where you want controls like that, and then a backup mode, which is what mm -hmm. I'm more thinking about, which is what happens at two in the morning. Yeah. So yeah, it, I, it I might, does. You you're just pipe, piping this over SSH, right? Yeah. Well, but, can't you can't you stick a rate limiter in the pipe? Sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I could, I could, yes, I could stick one in, but then I, but I've got it. If I want to do like retries and stuff like that, I would have to use the FS list to check the status rather than, rather than repping out the error messages. So yeah, but you're, you're right. I mean, I could definitely, I could, I could have it wedge whatever I want into it. Um, Yeah, it goes back to how how clean do you want it, and right, and part of it too is, you know, if it's got a terminal attached to it, give it verboseness. If it's not, it's running a cron job or something else, or throw out a flag of non interactive. Yeah, because the interact interactive ones are pretty much going to want to, you know, run at line speed. At least in my experience. Yeah, right. I I think yeah, I think adding adding just you know adding hooks for for all of this stuff for every every part of it, you know, probably makes sense. Something in between, you know, and then a hook for after stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely worth putting on the list. I think it needs to have something like that. Of course. Syncoid probably has all that already because they have it has a SOCAT, you know, it, option and PV option and all that stuff already already hooked in. So, yeah, so something more feature complete than, you know, like what what, yeah, I mean, I don't want to I don't want to recreate. Um, Syncoid, you know, if that's already out there and good and does all that stuff. Add it to the post it note. Yes. Excellent work, excellent question. And I'll just throw it out there. Uh, in talking to Chuck Tuffley, he's like, oh, Hillbilly ZFS replication. Oxide is doing something with Crucible. And the best description I could find was this one from Artemis. And so I thought it might teach us something, might not. It's pretty thorough. And Rodney, he's doing it on his Pi. So I tried to make sense of this. I will leave it to the reader. I will drop this in chat for everyone to read on their tablet on the commute home from the office to the bedroom or living room. Okay, so uh, I will also throw it out there. I have been using uh, more uh, closer to Vancouver than to Portland or Silverton uh, using Windows in disk images on ZFS. And I can no longer imagine running Windows without ZFS under the hood because rolling back is just critical. It is, it is beyond critical because any of those rollbacks and having to like restart with a bare metal install would be like add a day to this process. So just kudos to ZFS for being ZFS. Anyway. Has, when, has ZFS Windows gotten to the state where we can boot Windows from a... Uh, last I checked, no. But right. uh, surprisingly, I think it was React and ButterFS 
show what has to happen. So that was where Jorgen left off. And I will ask him that because that's indeed there, interesting. There is a P environment driver load time thing that I think you can load file systems. Okay. Uh, that would be where you would hook ZFS in so that you could boot it. Yes. That's where you, the installer also can do that. Sure. Uh, okay. What you say, it's part of the PE environment. Do you know the PE, exact flag PE. or? Uh -huh. what, that's in ZFS or in Windows? Windows. PE okay. is pre execution environment of Windows. Um, type. I can't type today. Okay, so hooks, uh, hooks for file systems. I'll fix that. I see it. Um, that said, uh, if you can, if it's an obvious set of hooks for what Veritas or they, I guess they choose between different levels of say refs. I hope they can boot to an NTFS and hypothetically FAT32. I don't know. So. Good to know. Uh, awesome. Good point. Ah, uh, this has been stunning. We are at an hour. Does anyone have anything else or shall we just revel in this great news? Stay warm, watch for the ice to melt and meet in a week. I second that motion. Okay. The ice part of the adjournment? Yes. Or both? Okay. <laughs> All awesome. the above. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, everyone. I'm happy to hang around a few minutes, but uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Keep up the good work, everyone, especially, wow, Daniel and Rodney. That's just stunning. Okay. Have a good one. Yes. Have a good week. Take care. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye.